Right. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope I'm clearly audible to all of you. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the first session of uh, the short course, uh, the Cryptography Fundamentals, that is about securing the digital world. So we'll get started for today. Uh, we'll take about two hours approximately for this uh, information session. So the idea today is to give you an overview uh, of what we will cover throughout the course as a starting point. So this is the agenda that we will be covering. Uh, we have several individuals who will be speaking today, um, starting from the head of the department, Dr. Ang Rodrigo, and then we have the keynote speaker for today, Dr. Shamita Di Alvis from the University of Bedfordshire. Then myself, I'm uh, Subodh Shals. I'll be the uh, coordinator of this course. And we also have uh, Randi and Yashen uh, and Sandushan who will be joining uh, to deliver the sessions. So this is the agenda for today uh, that you are seeing. So we'll start with the with the welcome and the introduction. Within the two hours, we plan on giving you an overview of what we will cover throughout the 16 days. That's approximately eight weeks, what you will be able to learn. So from the very beginning, when we were designing the, the curriculum and also the content for this course, we wanted to make sure that it's a structures, st structured course so that you can get the hands-on experience together with the fundamentals. So it will mostly be interactive. You will see that in today's session as well. So we waited for about five minutes for everyone to join. I can see that about uh, 20 people have joined so far, but we expect the number to increase to up to like 50. That's typically what happened within about 10 to 15 minutes, everybody starts joining. So thank you for joining us on a Saturday afternoon. Let's get started. Uh, let me start by inviting the, the head of the department of the Department of Electronic and Telecom Engineering at the University of Monotua, uh, Dr. Ang Rodrigo, uh, to say a few remarks, especially why, as a department, we are contributing to these short courses uh, and, as a department, what we are up to right now. So, Dr. Anger, over to you to give the introduction. Thank you, Dr. Charles. Welcome, everyone, uh, to the Cryptography Fundamentals course. Uh, now, I will describe why, as the department staff members, we do this course. Uh, so, Dr. Subodh Charles, myself, and uh, many of our associates uh, who have been studying in our department, uh, and uh, those who have gone abroad after studying, uh, will be uh, contributing to this course. So, I had described the reason for that. Uh, so, see, uh, in this uh, current world, many, many devices are now getting connected to the internet. Uh, so in the electronics department also, we make these kind of devices uh, that uh, connect to internet. And you know, in your households also, we like many devices like uh, smart players, maybe other, even washing machines and so on, uh, get connected to the internet. So what that means is like computers, uh, these systems will have to be secured. For example, if the system is controlling uh, something which is critical, maybe it is controlling controlling the low access uh, system. Uh, then we had to be very careful of those systems. We had to take care even more than that we take care of our computer systems. So as the computers run a lot of uh, sophisticated software, it is possible for those computers to have uh, security within themselves. And these networks have uh, firewalls and so on. Uh, so uh, these kind of uh, ideas will have to be discussed uh, in a course like this. So Dr. Charles himself, uh, he studied in the department as an undergraduate. Uh, then following that, he joined the University of Florida in the US. Uh, there he worked on security in cyber-physical systems. Now, that's an important area as I described just before. Uh, so we have gathered a lot of knowledge uh, regarding uh, this aspect as a department. So we want to make that knowledge available to others also. Uh, this is the reason we have started this program. Uh, so I know that extremely senior people are joining uh, uh, this course. Uh, so I don't want to mention their names. So I'm very respectful uh, to those people who are joining in that capacity. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining. Uh, so as Dr. Charles mentioned, we want to make this course a useful course to everyone uh, so that the examples that we take and the case studies that we take will be useful for your day-to-day -day businesses. And of course, uh, as uh, the de department staff members are there uh, doing this course, we would be able to answer any level of question uh, based on our knowledge uh, so that you can use this knowledge in your own uh, practices. 
So this is why uh, we want to do this course. Uh, so now thing about an online course is uh, there is a tendency uh, to get distracted uh, by different kinds of things. Uh, that's why uh, we like our audience to be a mature audience. Uh, so therefore they can, uh, they know uh, the, uh, they can judiciously uh, participate in this program uh, to get the maximum benefit out of that. So to briefly talk about the department, uh, I think most of you know uh, what the department is. The Department of Electronic and Telecommunication Engineering is a premier department at Moroto University's engineering faculty. Uh, so we have uh, two undergraduate degree programs, Electronic and Telecommunication Engineering degree program and Biomedical Engineering degree program. As you may have heard, these are the highest ranked in the country. And also we have... Uh, uh, two taught master's programs, one master's program in electronic and automation, where the bias is toward electronics, as you can understand from the name. And there is another master's program, a taught program, master's in telecommunication engineering. Actually, Dr. Charles himself is the person who is in charge of the electronic and automation master's program. Then, of course, we have research degrees, MPhil degree programs and PhD degree programs. So the students... Uh, who join these programs, especially the undergraduate students are exceptionally talented students. And uh, they themselves want to share the knowledge that they have learned. Uh, so uh, our idea is uh, as a university, um, we think that intelligent people gather uh, to our university, staff members and students for three things. That is to share knowledge, which is what we are doing in this knowledge sharing responsibility as a university. Then we have a responsibility to be the repository of knowledge. That means we must retain knowledge, retain knowledge in the minds of staff members, retain knowledge in our publications, retain knowledge in the minds of our students, and retain knowledge in our uh, digital media, knowledge repository. Then finally, we have to create knowledge. Uh, so creation means we have to do our own research and generate knowledge. For example, Dr. Charles has written books uh, in this area of crypto. So that, that way he has published his knowledge. Uh, so you can see as a department, we uh, share and we store and we create knowledge. So these are the three roles uh, of a university department. Uh, so right now we are addressing the very first role that means sharing knowledge, not only with the 100 undergraduates that we have, but also with the wider audience who like to uh, be benefited uh, from the knowledge that we have. So of course, you know, because our... Uh, collaborators and staff members are, are spending time and uh, there are other logistics. Uh, we have to charge some money. So uh, I hope that you can understand why we have to do that. Uh, so with this background, um, I encourage each one of you to get the maximum benefit out of that. Please engage with the resource persons who will be talking to you. Uh, so they are joining from different countries right now. I think Sandushan is joining from Australia. Mr. Kitmin is joining from uh, Canada right now. I don't know what time that is in, in Canada right now. And uh, of course, we are joining from Sri Lanka. Uh, Dr. Shamita is joining from England. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, all the contributors and uh, students or um, receivers of knowledge. I cannot say students. And some of them are my teachers also who are joining. So thank, thank you very much. I wish you very pleasant deliberations. Over to you, Dr. Charles. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anga, for those remarks. So we'll move on to the next item on our agenda, and uh, that will be a keynote uh, by Dr. Shamita Dialis, who, who uh, graciously agreed to get on board as a resource person and also as a consultant and advisor for this course. Uh, so Dr. Shamita is a senior member of IEEE. He's currently a lecturer at the School of Computer Science and Technology at the University of Bedfordshire in the United Kingdom. Uh, he received his PhD in electronic and electronic in, in electronic engineering from the University of Surrey in the UK in 2014. And before that, he got his BSc from the electronic and telecom department at the University of Moratua. That was in 2009. Uh, he's the founder head of the Department of Electronic Electrical and Electronic Engineering at the University of Sri Javardhanapura in Sri Lanka, where he also worked as a senior lecturer. He has worked in the capacity of a consultant and a network engineer in the telecommunications industry as well. Uh, he is actively conducting research and has a proven track record. Uh, he's been awarded with several competitive grants, while he has also actively 
contributed to many research projects, including EU FP7, uh, several funded research projects under his belt. So we are glad to have Dr. Shamita Dialvis uh, with us here today. Uh, Dr. Shamita, I will hand it over to you uh, for the keynote. Hi, uh, <clears throat> I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are, and we yes, can yes, you are. That's great, that's great. So I cannot say good morning or good afternoon because as uh, Dr. Anga, <laughs> my teacher mentioned that the people are joining from all over the world. So uh, let's uh, dive into uh, the keynotes uh, presentation. So uh, today we are going to look at 6G security. So I... <clears throat> You might be wondering why 6G? We are just uh, stepping our foot uh, to explore what 5G is. However, with 5G, uh, several areas are growing. <clears throat> Say for instance, uh, the expansion of IoT, uh, as Dr. Anga mentioned, the cyber physical interfaces are connecting many traditional devices into the internet. And uh, these devices also generate a large amount of small data. So we've heard about big data. But uh, actually, like uh, there's a new uh, area, this uh, small data, because th these are small sets of data with a limited <clears throat> time uh, validity. So these are needed for operations of machines, maybe like uh, traffic uh, monitoring and uh, those kind of things. And also with this large number of uh, devices getting connected, uh, it's not possible for a network engineer to manage all these devices manually. So we are going towards automated and self-sustaining networks. And this requires AI to be a significant part of uh, these communication networks, hence uh, to operate in uh, very minimal delays and also to identify uh, where these IoT devices are located. So these communications, computing control, localization and sensing, all those things should converge in the networks. And also, since there will be a large number of IoT devices, it will be impossible to keep track of uh, their chargeables and to power them. So we are moving towards zero energy IoT, maybe energy sharing, or maybe energy harvesting, and also many new communication technologies. And we also envisage uh, the future to have gadget-free communication. So rather than having devices or screens, people will interact with holograms. <clears throat> And also, uh, there's another interesting thing that the increasing elderly population, there's a, if you look at the statistics, uh, the number of elderly population is uh, increasing. So this means uh, the care that they need should be provided. So it's not possible to uh, use it because, you know, like the health care resources are very scarce. So we are moving towards ambient assistant living where the ambience and where, are, where there are different sensors, where there are different wearables that will monitor this elderly population and also assist them to live. And also many emerging technologies and applications. So if you look at them, <clears throat> and if you look at what 5G has to offer, we can see that the capabilities of 5G does not uh, it's not capable of sort of uh, uh, catering to these, uh, satisfying these uh, applications and these requirements. So this is why the world is moving towards 6G. Uh, there are a lot of new uh, uh, capabilities such as better data rates and even low delays and um, even uh, higher availability. So actually, most of these are realized through harnessing the capabilities of AI. So uh, if you look at where the world is now, you can see <clears throat> that researchers are at the moment working towards realizing these 6G technologies. They are studying, they are trying to sort of set standards. And um, by 2030, we envisage that 6G communication networks, uh, we will be able to experience and explore them. And if we look at the 6G applications, so we also talked about some uh, applications, uh, we can see that uh, <clears throat> one such application is autonomous vehicles. So at the moment also, we can see some vehicles appearing like uh, uh, autonomous driving and all those kind of things. However, this may also uh, sort of uh, grow up to UAVs and all those kind of things, uh, which may require extremely low latency and maybe uh, they may operate in swarms. And also if we look at Smart Grid 2.0, 
where uh, consumers uh, at the moment we see some people installing solar and all those kind of things so this trend will grow and we will not rely on a centralized energy provider and they'll not only be consumers and suppliers but they'll be prosumers who will not only generate energy who will uh, also consume energy and who will also share energy so these will require uh, more communication more sensors and also more <clears throat> security and if we look at many other applications like uh, personalized body area networks or industry 5.0 where people will uh, collaborate with uh, robots uh, and uh, they'll be cobots so those are known as collaborative robots who will uh, sort of boost the capabilities of humans so one example is iron man i, I believe you have watched that movie iron man where uh, a normal human is uh, capable of perform performing su superhuman activities harnessing the capabilities of machines and devices. So that's sort of like the idea of Industry 5.0, where people can uh, harness the capabilities of machines to do better stuff. So we looked at what 6G is, and I think now we have some sort of an idea of uh, how uh, the world will be by 2030. <clears throat> and with that idea, as uh, 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 the, this course is uh, focusing on, Security is uh, becoming a more and more critical aspect because if, if you look at this, uh, you can see that, uh, well, now uh, uh, the energy resources are connected, the nuclear plants are connected, the vehicles are connected, the healthcare is connected, industries are connected, and large swarms of UAVs are connected. So all these things getting connected to the internet means more opportunities for security threats. That means more security uh, vulnerabilities can emerge, right? That means the attack surface is increasing. So because of this, we have to be very careful about the security. And I'll just uh, sort of give an idea about what security is, how we can generalize these security concepts. So uh, security wise, uh, mainly the idea is uh, uh, to sort of uh, ensure three goals. So there, there are confidentiality, integrity, and availability. If you want to remember, you can think of CIA. So confidentiality means uh, ensuring that information is secure and only accessible by, by people who are intended to access, access them. So if you use a password for your uh, email or if you use a fingerprint scan for your mobile device, so, so those are authentication systems that ensure that uh, your information that's stored is confidential. So for, for that, you can use many authentication systems, say like a, what you have, maybe uh, like a mobile phone or a, a card or something like that, or what you know, like a password or a pin number or uh, what you are, like uh, the way you speak or your iris or your fingerprint. So likewise, you can use many authentication mechanisms to ensure confidentiality. And the integrity wise, we want to ensure that the information that is stored is not changed. And availability wise, we want to ensure that whenever we want, that the information that we need are available. So uh, <clears throat> in order to sort of uh, ensure that these security principles are in place, we have to ensure that these security principles are applied to information in different stages when the information is stored, when the information is being processed, and when the information is being transmitted, and to do this, we can um, have several countermeasures like technology-wise, we can have policies and practices, and we can also have people who are aware and who have these kind of practices. So uh, I will not go into details of this, but uh, I think now you have some sort of an idea on what security is and uh, how people sort of try to uh, reach this security. And, um, <clears throat> So with that knowledge and with the idea on what we uh, know about 6G now, let's see what 6G security landscape will be like. So we are moving from 1G to 6G. So we are moving from analog voice where they had some uh, threats like eavesdropping and uh, those kind of things. And then we move towards uh, 2G. So uh, likewise things, uh, uh, gradually move towards a digital domain and then mobile broadband, IP traffic, and with 4G, better broadband, and with 5G, more connected devices, and with 6G, with AI, with quantum computing on the horizon, and uh, many new physical layer technologies, how will 
the threat landscape? How will the security landscape be? So 6G will have several uh, aspects when we discuss about 6G security. So some are inherited uh, from uh, the pre-6G era, uh, many like DOS attacks, DDoS attacks, and all those kind of things uh, which are already there in the uh, vicinity. And also, uh, if we move towards 60 specific attacks, we can see that uh, they'll uh, be tiny cells. There'll be a lot of mesh networks. There'll be a lot of uh, zero touch networks with AI and uh, less human interaction. And uh, there'll be large number of devices uh, and also uh, maybe uh, 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 BCI, like brain computer interaction and uh, maybe uh, healthcare IoT devices and all those kind of things which will sort of uh, explore our lifestyle, not only our lifestyle, our uh, uh, our heart rate and maybe like uh, our stress level and all those kind of things. So it, it can raise a lot of privacy issues. So um, one such example that I usually uh, tell my <clears throat> students in uh, the introductory lectures is that, uh, you know, when people have diabetes, they have these uh, small uh, devices uh, that, are, that stay inside their body so that can read the blood sugar level uh, that's a connected device right and then it releases insulin <clears throat> so in the future uh, uh they we, we we might unfortunately read like uh, murder cases where an attacker has a uh, sort of get into this uh, hacked into this uh, device which releases insulin and uh, it can release large number of insulin large amounts of insulin uh, in, in that way with a few lines of codes uh, they can sort of uh, perform these kind of activities. So you can see how uh, this uh, the advancement of technologies, the advancement of healthcare, and all those kind of things also exposes more threats and more attacks. And how uh, future attackers uh, will try to exploit them. And that's why uh, it is very important for us to get a very good idea about security. So uh, 6D will also incorporate a lot of technologies, AI, machine learning, blockchain, quantum computing, visible light communication. So these will also have their own uh, uh, vulnerabilities. So this is how the threat landscape and the security landscape of 6G will be. So uh, also uh, the new technologies, for instance, like with 5G, we envisage networks to be sliced. So uh, uh, in uh, one of our recent papers, we explored how this network slicing can um, sort of uh, be uh, advantageous, uh, harnessing the capabilities of software networks. However, it will also have a lot of security issues. Say, if you dig deep, you can see the life cycle security of network slice, uh, communication between sizes and within sizes, how they explore how they can be exploited by attackers. So likewise, you can see like uh, each technology, if you dig deep, you can see that they also come with a lot of uh, advantages, but also a lot of security vulnerabilities. So uh, <clears throat> so I focused on network sizing. However, if we look at it in a, a broader view, we can see that if we look at AI, so AI is uh, sort of like the hype, People think that when AI is applied to some place, uh, everybody everything will be perfect. But uh, AI will also come with a lot of uh, uh, possibilities for attackers. Say, for instance, uh, they uh, sort of bank on the data that that is being used to train these kind of uh, AI models. So attackers can uh, sort of poison these uh, training models, and they can sort of uh, try to evade these uh, different learning models and. Uh, Sort of uh, try to bypass the learning models and attack the APIs, and also uh, same as uh, uh, like the inherited attacks, uh, they can attack this uh, uh, infrastructure. So likewise, you can see that uh, these new technologies also uh, give rise to new set of uh, vulnerabilities. So if you look at DLT, like uh, distributed ledger technologies, like blockchain, many kind of things like fifty-one percent attack, where more than half of the nodes uh, can be compromised though it's uh, not realistic if there are a large number of devices, a large number of participating nodes in this kind of blockchain. So uh, if you look at quantum computing, quantum cl cloning attacks, and if you look at terahertz communication, so eavesdropping and maybe like access control attacks, because you know, like uh, this terahertz communication can happen only in a very small distance because of the large, uh, high frequency. 
and also visible light communication. So that's using the uh, light that we see to communicate, right? So say for instance, uh, the a light in our ceiling can turn on, uh, can switch on and switch off in a very high rate that the normal human eye will not recognize it. However, a sensor can sort of identify that and um, use that for communication. But then these kind of things can be blocked and uh, maybe people can introduce uh, a lot of interference even with a torch, right? So you can see how the new landscape is uh, going to be different than what we experience. And uh, if you look at AI, so AI enables a lot of functions in future networks. Say for instance, uh, automated services and all those kind of things in the application layer. If you look at the control layer, like a uh, parameter optimization, uh, resource management and all those kind of things. And if you look at the network edge, maybe filtering data, uh, extracting features and all those kind of things. And if you look at sensing, data collection, and uh, sort of uh, monitoring the environment. However, if you look at each of these layer, you can see that there are threats uh, and security and privacy issues <laughs> related to them, right? So data privacy issues uh, and uh, maybe like uh, blockchain attacks for blockchain and all those kind of things in the application layer. Attacks on SDN, and uh, the NFV and uh, the ones that we saw related to network slicing can happen in the intelligent control layer. In the physical layer, DOS attacks, DDoS attacks. So I, I think you will explore about these attacks uh, individually when you follow the course. So, uh, and also attacks on uh, machine learning models. Uh, and if you look at the intelligence uh, sensing layer, maybe uh, the IoT devices, uh, these devices have very less computational capabilities. So. Uh, 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 there can be uh, att attacks on them and maybe eavesdropping, jamming, and all those kind of things. So <clears throat> because of these things, <clears throat> if we look at uh, these uh, 6G applications, they come, they have their own security requirements. So this is what the researchers are working at the moment to uh, cater to this requirement and to provide security solutions for these security requirements. Say, for instance, uh, if you look at, any such application like uh, maybe connected autonomous vehicles where vehicles are autonomous, but they are also connected so they can make cumulative decisions. Say, say uh, they can sort of uh, not only drive themselves uh, from point A to B, but they can be controlled in such a way that uh, the traffic of a certain uh, large area can be minimized. So they can work uh, together like swarms. So <clears throat> they should be operated at a reduced cost. Right, and also like uh, the operation should be real time. So this is a this is a significant challenge because uh, accessing to this kind of AI and ML algorithms, uh, they consume a lot of computational uh, capacity. So how can uh, they be processed? Uh, like we cannot imagine a supercomputer to fix in uh, all the vehicles. So many uh, technologies are also developing with this, such as multi-access edge computing or edge AI, where the network edge <clears throat> also is. Uh, capable of uh, also is uh, equipped with powerful computational resources where these end nodes can uh, seamlessly communicate and get their processing tasks done or they can offload their processing tasks. So this is kind of like an overall picture. So you can see in any place, like if you look at intelligent health, there are ethical and AI security uh, can happen. So it is a challenge. So this is what the security engineers, the security researchers are sort of trying to address. So, um, so there are many security requirements if we generalize them. So uh, the security solutions that are provided should be lightweight. They should have low latency. They should be extremely scalable because the, of the large number of devices that will be connected and um, uh, it is also envisaged that we are we should move towards zero touch security. So all the security processes and operations and monitoring can be sort of automated and uh, to ensure high privacy, proactive security and uh, security at the edge. And uh, maybe like uh, uh, we can see that there are different cloud services at the moment, like software as a service and all those kind of things. So maybe security via edge or security as a service at the edge can also become some sort of a new area where uh, there'll be a lot of business cases and applications. And um, the 
there are many challenges at the moment that the researchers uh, are trying to sort of resolve because uh, the, the first thing is limited resources because uh, it's providing security will need a lot of processing, a lot of uh, filtering, a lot of uh, analytics. So they need a lot of uh, computational power and the devices are diverse. So they use different protocols. So in such cases, like how to provide security, right? And high mobility because uh, 6G is also envisaging to uh, provide connectivity to uh, uh, space uh, uh, sort of exploration. So space traveling, because we see in news at the moment that uh, there are many like uh, Elon Musk is trying to make space traveling a thing, right? So how to provide connectivity to them? They have very high mobility and also maybe deep sea tourism. So that's another area that's being sort of developed and explodes. Though we hear some sad news in those areas, we can see that, they, that those areas are growing, right? So at the moment, they are very costly, but in the future, they will also be explored to uh, uh, the common people uh, like us. So then uh, we need to provide uh, connectivity to those kind of things, but then how to make it secure, right? And then that there can be also physical tampering, terrorist attacks, and many kind of... Uh, security challenges that we need to address. And th those are the things that we are working on and researching at the moment. So some potential solutions. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, one is like uh, having distributed and scalable AI and email security, explainable AI, distributed ledger technology, quantum security and physical layer security. Say for instance, uh, if we look at AI and 6G security, so uh, AI can be, um, uh, sort of like an enabler for security. They can make systems autonomous. They can make a learning federated. They can facilitate deep learning. However, AI will also need uh, to be secure. So secure for AI is also, uh, security for AI is also part of uh, uh, the research to when, when employing AI for 6G security. So how to uh, make it ethical, how to make these models uh, resilient and how to make them trustworthy. So if you look at the AI uh, 6G landscape, you can see that, well, attackers uh, or adversaries can uh, learn different systems, learn, learn about different activities, learn about different patterns using AI. And also they can uh, attack different uh, uh, AI models. On the other hand, uh, at other edges, maybe like the edge devices can be attacked. Edge AI can be poisoned, model evasion attacks, and so on and so forth. And they can be compromised nodes. On the other hand, as we uh, saw in this slide, AI can be used for security. They can be used for secure authentication, authorization, detection of anomalies, and also like a defensive moving targets, and so on and so forth. You can see that this AI is uh, sort of like a double-edged sword, right? So it, it, it enables 5G to develop as 6G to uh, be more capable to provide uh, seamless connectivity. However, it also comes with uh, some vulnerabilities. And uh, if we look at XAI, so this is explainable AI. This is another interesting area because at the moment, uh, AI means uh, training a model and then we have to rely on the model. We don't know how the model operates, how the model makes decisions. But explainable AI asks questions. Why, uh, whom, what, where, when, how. So it tries to sort of uh, explain uh, the process that's happening uh, with AI. Uh, in a way that humans or the experts can understand. So they can ensure that whatever the process that's happening uh, does not miss something essential maybe. So in that case, they, it can be trained in a better way. Or else, uh, maybe it's, uh, if it's doing something unethical. So all those kind of things uh, can be understood. So uh, the idea of XAI is to uh, sort of uh, decode the way, the decode the operation of AI in order to understand what's happening uh, and sort of a streamline the process or improve the process. And uh, the other uh, part is you can see that uh, when we use AI in, uh, in, in 6G, we can sort of use it, uh, this XAI uh, in several layers. So maybe the perception layer to understand how these devices operate and also within the uh, network to understand how they operate and how we can sort of make it more efficient or maybe uh, to push it towards following different standards and also in different uh, applications, we can use XAI. So blockchain is another buzzword that's uh, sort of uh, 
being used in many places. Uh, so blockchain is the technology that powers Bitcoin, uh, though it has many other uh, capabilities uh, and it's uh, being realized as a, uh, been identified as a core technology that will uh, back many future networks and applications. So if you look at uh, different types of attacks uh, and different types of uh, challenges uh, in uh, sort of uh, mitigating these attacks, blockchain comes as a solution which provides secure authentication, access control, uh, integrity, uh, accountability, transparency, and all those kind of things. So uh, researchers are sort of uh, uh, exploiting blockchain technology to incorporate that into 6G to make it more secure, to have a blockchain as a part and partial and as an integrated technology of 6G. So uh, you can see, uh, even if we uh, won't go into individual details, that blockchain can play a significant part in uh, many uh, 6G trends. Uh, say, for instance, uh, if it's a zero energy IoT, it can improve the efficiency and control of different uh, uh, connecting different energy resources. Uh, they can reduce the cost. They can operate these kind of a uh, large number of uh, devices in a transparent uh, uh, and secure manner. So likewise, uh, each of these uh, applications uh, have a, a blockchain as an integral component. So that's why blockchain is identified as an uh, important technology towards uh, 6G. So quantum computing, so this is something that uh, still we have not seen uh, uh, a significant leap uh, in, in the development. So, uh, so quantum computing is a new era of computing where uh, information bits are not seen as bits, uh, but in a different way. So, uh, so it will sort of, uh, uh, these quantum computers are going to be uh, so effective in breaking existing cryptographic mechanisms. So, uh, uh, because like they'll be so powerful, uh, like uh, whatever the method that we use to uh, find prime numbers and uh, sort of find the reverse prime numbers and all those kind of things uh, need to be quantum resilient. So there's another branch of research that's moving towards uh, making networks, making cryptography, making key distribution uh, quantum resilient and like quantum key distribution. So that will also uh, raise a new uh, sort of explore, expose a new uh, uh, threat uh, uh, area, threat surface or attack surface because there will be attacks on quantum based attacks, right? So still like it's a solution. You So you can see it's a solution, but it also comes as a threat. And also physical layer security, say for instance, like a visible light communication. So at the moment, like if you uh, if it's Wi-Fi or something like that, you can uh, place some sort of uh, Wi-Fi receiver outside and then listen or sniff packets or listen to other communications. But we can sort of if we use visible light communication, we can make the light uh, sort of uh, uh, to stay within that room or that area in, uh, and sort of ensure the communication is secure and only sort of stays within that uh, area, intended area. And also um, we are moving from MIMO to large intelligent surfaces. So where there'll be large number of antennas, uh, so they can uh, sort of uh, transmit uh, focus beams. So uh, unintended parties will not uh, be able to receive those transmissions. And also terahertz communication uh, limits the communication distance. And uh, we can sort of uh, make sure that we can uh, focus and only transmit to the intended person. So likewise, we can see that uh, these new technologies that we were talking about uh, can be exploited, can be sort of uh, uh, developed to provide a more secure landscape in the 6G era. So uh, the solutions that we need to develop uh, should have a better protection level uh, and also the time to respond should be very less and they should sort of uh, converge different technologies and uh, sort of provide efficient solutions. The autonomous city level should be very high. The AI robustness should be very high. And the security of uh, the convergence time, security AI model convergence time should be very low. So likewise, you can see that uh, when developing these kind of solutions, like we have to adhere to strict KPIs because in 6G, we are talking about like 0.1 millisecond delays and maybe uh, we are talking about applications like remote surgeries. So we can see how uh, like within a split second or even like uh, <laughs> like a very less time than that, they sh there, there should be a lot of operations happening and they should also be secure. So uh, 
performing all these actions should be seamless and autonomous. So uh, there are many challenges for researchers and also like uh, for the industry to adopt these technologies and to ensure that uh, whatever the operations that they perform are secure. So I think that's why it's a very timely idea to expose uh, you uh, to the new threat landscapes, uh, to the new uh, vulnerabilities, to the uh, and also uh, to educate you about the new solutions that we can provide to, um, and also like what are the new solutions uh, in the vicinity where, which, which you will be working on maybe uh, in five, six years time. So that's uh, the end of my, uh, presentation and uh, if you have any questions i'm uh, more than happy to answer thank you uh, dr chamita we'll give a few seconds uh, if the audience has any questions While we get some questions from the audience, uh, one question from my side. Now, when you look at information security, that's a huge area. People can decide to specialize on uh, several sub areas or like sub components within this vast area. So if somebody is like getting started, uh, which is what our audience, uh, the people who have joined today is planning to do, um, what would you recommend? Like any any place where people can get started on this. Of course, this course is one starting point. Yes. Uh, so uh, actually, it's a, it's really good to start a course like this because if you look at uh, uh, what's happening in the UK, is that they are sort of uh, trying to make uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, particular thing called like Cyber Essentials Compliance. So they are sort of trying to make all the organizations to get this certificate. So that will ensure that uh, they have... Uh, they, are say, they have at least a basic level of security, right? So all this information is made available online. And also uh, places like uh, organizations like Cisco are making available some courses for the uh, industry and for the uh, public to sort of uh, learn about security. So uh, I think the starting point is uh, sort of uh, identifying the concepts. So I think uh, that uh, this course will be a very good starting point for that. So you will learn what security is, what are the security principles and how we can sort of apply uh, these kind of things as technologies, uh, the ones that we discussed or as uh, policies and practices where a lot of organizations manage your stuff. So we might have people who are in the management layer so they can sort of make decisions like this. So they can maybe ensure that their organizations follow like ISO 27,000 series of uh, standards, right? And those kind of things. And also people, because um, see, uh, at the moment, I'm teaching a unit called uh, ethical hacking. So they are uh, uh, one thing that these organizations do is that they hire people known as ethical hackers. So they try to penetrate into network as hackers. So in most of the cases, uh, uh, what, what they find that they, they explore these social engineering skills to exploit uh, the vulnerabilities of people, maybe act like and maybe send an old person saying that, uh, well, I cannot access to my Wi-Fi. I have to uh, send this uh, uh, WhatsApp message to my son and please help me get connected. So that way they can connect a device to a Wi-Fi network inside an organization. So once they get connected into that, they can move from there. They can uh, uh, sort of uh, exploit that connection to get more and more connected inside to the network and maybe finally get the root password for the mainframe, who knows? So, uh, and uh, so these kind of things like uh, will help uh, sort of to uh, our, our audience to sort of grow their knowledge. But the thing is, as you said, it's a very wide area. So where you will focus uh, will depend on what you will learn afterwards. But initially, I think uh, understanding the concepts and getting the concepts right uh, will be vital. Thank you very much. I think... Uh... Is that the question that most people have, at least the people who are joining this course right now? I mean, if you have learned about cybersecurity, then uh, you you have a background, but the beginners, because there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of resources out there. But right now, I believe the challenge is to know what exactly to follow, because in the information age, we don't have a problem of lack of information; it's everywhere. But how to like curate the content and come up with the ones that are more suitable for what we want to achieve is, I believe, the, the challenge that we have right now. So thank you for those insights.
so any other questions <clears throat> while uh, talking about this like uh, i saw uh, re recently a new type of attacks so those are known as uh, like uh, say chatbots we sort of uh, enter different information so uh, there's a new type of attacks where you can sort of uh, put these commands in such a way that you can uh, make them provide information that they are not uh, uh, intended to provide. So those are known as prompt-based injection attacks. So like in this era also, uh, you can also use chat GPT and all those kind of things uh, to learn about an area that you have no idea about and then start gradu gradually start exploring. But so you can see like all the areas uh, sort of have security vulnerabilities. Yes. Okay. Well, yeah, I think, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shamika. We'll take the remaining time of the session to explain to the audience what we will be covering in this course. So we really, really appreciate your time uh, joining us and also for your insights. You're of course welcome to stay connected. Uh, thank you very much for the for your insights. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Right, so with that, let's get to the, uh, the last two bullet points. We actually thought of combining these two the interactive session and also the course introduction. Uh, and then we can we will leave some time for audience question and answers as well. Uh, so if, if you're thinking that I'm going to speak here for another one hour, that is not going to happen because you might be bored, of course, after lunch, not a very ideal time to sit down and listen to something. So we'll try to make this interactive as much as we can. Right. So this is the same exact same way that we will conduct our lectures throughout the course. So let's dive into the course introduction. This will be delivered by me. I'm Subodh and I'm joined by uh, Yashen and Randi. Yashen is currently a senior engineer of information security at Sentry Labs and Randi is a cyber security engineer at Vetstoria. Uh, so with those two individuals joining me, we'll give a introduction to the course and we'll give a flavor about the uh, the interactive way that we are going to conduct this course. Right. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time here in these slides. Dr. Chamita already gave a very good overview of what information security is. I wanted to quickly go through what has happened so far. Because when we talk about security, in the early days, like maybe in the first uh, in the 20th century, in the beginning of 20th century, security maybe looked like this, right? A security guard with guns telling you whether you can enter somewhere or not. But now we have a very different idea of security. And that looks like this. So if you're watching like movies, if you're a fan of Mr. Robot, for example, it's all computers and people in hoodies, some green color characters going up and down. So that's kind of like the idea that we get when we think security. But overall, right now, the we, we, we call it cyber security, meaning that it's happening on the internet, right? In multiple aspects. Right now, it's not only the internet, we have physical devices as well, which is why we called cyber physical systems. So the security landscape is now evolving around that. This has become mainly important because we have things like Internet of Things that Dr. Samit also touched upon, uh, different communication protocols, quantum computing coming in, AI. So the security landscape is huge. It's broad. Within that, an engineer can decide to specialize on a few aspects. But whatever we do, we first have to have the basics to understand. Right? Then from that point onwards, you can decide that, okay, I would like to specialize in this area and that area, but the key fundamentals are critical. That is what differentiates you from being an excellent engineer. So now from the history, from the old days until today, with the, with the evolving nature of our communication infrastructure, we have had a history of attacks as well. So these are the vulnerabilities that people try to exploit. So here is a rough timeline of computer viruses that came into the picture uh, over the years, starting from like the 1970s and all the way to 2030. So if you read about these different computer viruses, you will see different characteristics coming in, right? So some of these viruses are unintentional, meaning that the attacker did not intend to cause any harm. They were doing some things and then something happened 
eventually it ended up being a disaster right so these computer viruses ha has have had a history like you're seeing on this slide and in the recent past we can see things escalating right so it's never been more important than it is now to be ready for cyber attacks and if i talk to you in 5 years time i will tell the same thing that is because it is a huge challenge no system whether it's banking whether it's health whether it's administrative no system will be secure unless we make it secure right so the demand for these security engineers is huge so if you are thinking that okay security is something that is applicable to north america or europe not that much for sri lanka well you are definitely mistaken you can see some news articles here uh, a title says sri lanka among the top 10 countries in asia facing threats to cyber security here are some more examples of things that happened in the recent past right things like ransomware uh, corporate espionage different things can potentially happen so this is why the role of a security engineer is important it is all about reducing risk that is what we want to focus on when you start to answer the question why is security engineering sorry what is security engineering and why is it important that is a it's an endless discussion a more easier question to answer is if i flip the question that means if you don't have security what can go wrong right so that's why i say the value is best realized in not doing the right thing well i think you can answer this question by yourself you can face hefty financial losses your rep your your reputation can be damaged so here are a few numbers that i'm throwing at you showing you the cost of a data breach this report is from ibm i'm not sure whether with the video is blocking your view uh, the report is from ibm which reported that the average cost of a data breach is around this number right and the average number of days to identify and contain a data breach well this is not very good news as you can see the share of breaches initially caused by compromised credentials so this is one aspect that we'll talk about in the course that is passwords and the relevant discussion about credentials so you can see the financial losses are huge and this is only one example we can talk about several uh, other examples as well so this is a data breach there are say few many other things that can go wrong in the security environment so these numbers on the left they are from 2021 you can see some things have gotten better with our infrastructure some have gotten worse so we need to make progress in the right direction so the challenge the security engineers are facing right now is mainly that we need to protect our systems against the risks that we know and also the risks we have never seen well that's the whole idea right you defend against the things that you know right now but tomorrow a smart hacker can come up with a brand new type of attack they can exploit some something that the world never knew then at that point we need to scramble and find solutions dr shamita talked about ethical hacking well that is the way that organizations kind of make sure that their security infrastructure is proof it's future proof from hackers they hire people and they ask them to hack into their system then if those ethical hackers find some sort of vulnerability then they can fix it before the bad guys can exploit the same vulnerability right so that's why being up to date knowing the fundamentals is critical in this area so it's not only a matter of applying some tools available to you you need to know how it works otherwise because the tools are developed for something that we already know if you are to come up with something that is brand new you have to use your imagination and you need to know the basics to make sure that you can come up with the next defense for the next attack that you have not seen so far so this is important to the company that you are working with to your customers and eventually to the entire world when you become a security engineer there are many aspects that you can specialize in so here are some you can specialize in things like application security 
So this is the area where we talk about the security of applications. You might be running web applications. You might be running mobile applications. How can you secure them? Then network and systems. I think you understand what this means. And the incident response kind of work, which means if something goes wrong, can you quickly get into that, understand what went wrong, maybe mitigate the, the threat from spreading in a, in a larger area, and then quickly take some uh, preventive action. Then we have data security. So of course, if you Google, you will find many other specializations that come under security engineer. There are many players in, in the global market that, that come under, that, that we can recognize as companies in the global cybersecurity market. So here are some. When you start from somewhere and you become an expert in this area, these global players are there and you have a very good chance of even working for them. Right? So we have, of course, Sri Lankans working in these global companies. And there are companies within Sri Lanka as well in the cybersecurity market. For example, the Millennium IT ESP is one uh, leading company. They work with all these global uh, vendors and cybersecurity solutions providers. So there are many such companies in Sri Lanka where you can be employed. And also with COVID, I think it's a very common thing for people to work from Sri Lanka to companies outside of Sri Lanka. But all of those companies will have the requirement of talent. But the problem is, are you the person with the capabilities to fill that requirement? So if you're interested in this area, well, of course, you have to start somewhere, which is what we are trying to do by giving you the necessary tools and ingredients to start in this very exciting domain and to excel down the line. So this is our motivation in providing these courses for you in addition to the, uh, the the usual modules that we have in our universities and the people who are joining from the industry, they are at their workplaces as well. Okay, so with that, I think I talked for about 10 minutes. And from this point onwards, it is going to be an interactive session. So for that, I would appreciate if you can go to this website, Mentimeter. So let me drop the website in the chat. It's www.menti, the first five words, Mentimeter, right? Let me, let me take the annotation tool and I'll try to, we'll try to write it on the slide as well. Sorry, I forgot to mention the website. So that's on me. Okay, so that's www.menti.com. So please, use your device, whether it's a laptop or a mobile device to go to this website. And we will have some questions for you that we are going to deliver through Mentimeter and we expect you to answer. We'll have a conversation based on that. And whoever, so it's a quiz by the way, you get marks, uh, but it's only for fun. You get marks, whoever becomes our leader, we will have a surprise for you. A good surprise, not a bad surprise. Okay, so I'll give you like 30 seconds. Go to menti.com. You can see on the slide and you have to put in the code, the 89851818 code that you see on the screen right now, which I will send on Zoom as well. Right, so go to menti.com and this. Let me see if people have joined Mentimeter. Okay, we'll give you a few seconds. So the way this is going to work is if you join using your mobile device or your laptop, whatever that is, you will see a question coming up in the in the window and some of those questions will be multiple choice meaning that we give you some choices you have to click on the correct choice the choice that you think is correct and then some questions will be you will have to type something and submit okay there are two questions where you will have to run a small script a python script to get the answer don't worry 
if you have no idea about python that is okay we are giving you the code and we will also show you how to run it okay it it can all be done online so if you are using a laptop it might be easier for you because you can easily copy paste things uh, but yes we will give you those materials okay i hope people have joined we let's move on to uh, the story so this is the story that we will I'm still having my annotation tool. Let me get rid of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So our story will be this. Let me remove my annotations. Otherwise, it gets in the way. And then I will reshare after enabling audio so that you can listen to what the video has to say. All right, so this is the story around which we will be asking you the questions, right? Let's watch this. It's only like 30 seconds to one minute, but listen carefully. The questions will be based on this and don't worry, you're getting started in cybersecurity. So you don't have any idea. Let's assume maybe you do, but that doesn't matter. You can answer these questions using your general knowledge. Okay, but on, you can only do that if you stay connected to the story and understand how the two, how the pieces fit together. Okay. With that, without further ado, let's see the video and let's go for the quiz. A small tech startup in San Francisco. Sarah arrives at the office on a Monday morning to discover that a mysterious USB drive has been left on the main conference room table. Sarah took the USB drive and looked to see if Jake has arrived. Right, so let me run that video again because it's only a few seconds for those who missed because this is uh, our story. Let's see that again. A small tech startup in San Francisco. Sarah arrives at the office on a Monday morning to discover that a mysterious USB drive has been left on the main conference room table. Sarah took the USB drive and looked to see if Jake has arrived. Okay, so we successfully managed to add a spooky audio to that to give you, you know, the cybersecurity engineer feeling. I hope we succeeded on that. Right. This is our story. So somebody came to office early in the morning, Sarah, in our example, and found a USB stick lying on the table. That is our starting point. And there's another engineer in the company by the name of Jake. So Sarah and Jake will unravel this mystery together. I hope now you can see the Mentimeter screen and not the slides. So these are title, the mysterious USB drive. When I go to the next slide, you will see the first question coming up in your phone. Okay, so let me be ready from my side as well to make sure that uh, everything is fine. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take part in the quiz together with you. Then I can make sure that whatever you are seeing, I am able to see that as well. Right, I hope everyone is ready. Let's see. The first question. Let's see how many people we have. 18, 19. So I'm also going to join. That makes us 20. So the alien face is me. And our other instructors will also join, I believe. Right. So you can add your name, by the way. Don't forget your name. Because at the end of the session, I told you the winner gets a surprise. All right. We have 19 players ready. Let's see what the first question is. You get marks for the accuracy and also how fast you give the answer. Right? Let me repeat that again. You get marks for the accuracy and also how fast you give the answer. So that doesn't mean that you should give the wrong answer very fast. Give the right answer very fast. But even if, if it takes time for you to understand, that's okay. Right? But that is how the leaderboard, the winner will be chosen. 
Let's see what the first question is. I think I skipped the slide. Right, there we go. Look at your device. You can see the question. You can give the answer. You have approximately a minute to give the answer. Right, last few seconds. Okay, so we have 13 people who gave the right answer and some people gave the other answers as well. Right, so what would you do? An interesting story that I wanted to share with you. There was one research that uh, one of my collaborators at uh, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in the US did. So they did exactly the same thing. What they did was, in the so University of Illinois Urbana Champaign is a top school in computer science. Throughout the campus premises, they distributed about 50 USB devices all over the place. Some were in the roads, some were in the cafeteria, on a desk, so in different places. Then, if somebody plugs in that USB device, they would run this auto run application, and that auto run application will send some data to the researchers. That was what we did. So you will be surprised to see many people actually plugged in these devices. I mean, it's none of their business, right? <laughs> it was not their USB device, but out of curiosity, they would plug this in. And the researchers, they published a very interesting paper based on the findings. So you can refer to that if you are uh, interested. This exact same thing. So I think uh, the people who are joining this course as instructors from the industry, Ramdi and Yashin, uh, can attest to this, can add more to this. What would you do if you find a USB device on the conference table? Would you plug it in? What can go wrong, by the way? If you plug it into the computer to see, what can happen? Uh, super, just like what you said. Sorry, Camilla. Yeah. So uh, the problem will be we don't know what's in there. So it can be a genuine mistake and left by them but at the same time there will be something uh maybe malicious script as you mentioned because we don't need the auto run anymore you just need to plug it in and the rest can be done uh, pretty easily so that's where the tricky problem is you don't you don't even understand what kind of a script will it run in the back end and communicate something that you don't want to so we saw what happened at Stuxnet, right so best case is to give it to the it guys and we know how to plug it in a perfectly secure device which is like properly adapted with the required things, monitoring all the parameters there itself. Yep, exactly. So the people who gave the other answers, I hope you got the idea. Let's see what the next question is. We still have the players. By the way, if you drop out of Mentimeter anytime, you can simply follow the same rule. You can see at the top of the screen, join menti.com and use the code. So that's exactly what you need to do. And so don't worry. Well, of course, if you don't answer a question, you will lose marks. But other than that, you can stay connected with the quiz. Let's see what the second question is.
Okay, so we have most people who gave the answers, right? Everyone has voted. So we didn't even need the one minute. People are fast. Huh. No wrong answers. Well, that's good news. I think we kind of gave the answer in our previous explanation. So why would a cyber <laughs> potentially leave a USB in a com company's conference room? Well, of course, it's not to test the company's USB quality. I can assure you that. Uh, yeah. I don't think explanation is necessary. It is to potentially spread malware. So let's move forward to the next question. Here is our leaderboard. We have Vilan. It sounded like Vilan. We are into like cyber yeah. thing. <laughs> it's a pseudonym or something like that. No, I hope you are the good guy. Anyway, so Vilan is leading the uh, the pack right now. Let's see whether Vilan can hold on to the leadership position in the next few questions as well. Next question. we are almost we have given the answers right so the question is sarah wonders if the usb drives content might be encrypted which of these is not a type of encryption so maybe this is a tough question for those who are getting started on cybersecurity, uh, but we wanted to get an idea about whether you have at least heard of these things even if you use like the rule of elimination you can come to this answer without knowing what RSA and AES is. Has anyone watched the movie Troy? I'm not expecting an answer for that, but that's that's how the, the Trojan thing came up. So we'll talk about this uh, in detail during the course about uh, the Caesar cipher, RSA and AES. Uh, these are Especially RSA and, RSA and AES, very uh, popular words. If you are a security engineer, you should know definitely. If you find a security engineer who doesn't know what AES and RSA are, then, well, that might not be an actual engineer. So we have a problem. So, yeah, we will get to know about these things throughout the, throughout the course. Trojan host is not the right answer. It is, in a way, a social engineering uh, method where you hide something in something else that looks very innocent, right? So out of, when you look at it from outside, that looks very harmless. But if you take that thing into your system, then things can go wrong. Like the USB stick, for example, right? So uh, one common example would be like uh, most of the, people have been using a uh, crack software so you might download the crack software and install and it will work like original but you might not notice is like the malware itself is running in the background so that is the uh, kind of malware trojan horse is so just like what randy said uh, the, the main thing we are seeing nowadays is the botnets so the moment you download a crack software, maybe call the pirated software, it's basically you just install kind of a botnet, like you become a bot for some botnet manager and you will be sold in the dark web on like a volume basis. So at the, at these hackers will say that, okay, I have a botnet of 100,000 bots and how much do you want? So you'll be a part of a, a larger scheme of attacks without even having an idea that you are a bot yourself with this. So unless you have some sophisticated tools, you will never even, like never even, uh, understand you are part of a bot at all. So that's where the uh, reality is heading actually. So we'll talk about this in detail during the course. Let's see what the next question is. 
question four. So I hope you kind of get a hang of how these going to happen, right? I mean, you get like 60 seconds, you answer as soon as everybody has voted, the timer will stop and then we'll discuss the answers. Okay. And when we move forward in the quiz, we will be giving you less time because some of the questions had 60 seconds in the beginning, but later on we'll reduce the time because now you kind of get a hang of how Mentimeter works. Okay. Question number four. Right. Most people gave the right answer. So the question is, now these two engineers, Jake and Sarah, they are having the conversation. Jake tells Sarah that the USB's content are encrypted. And to decrypt this encrypted data, they need some piece of data. The question is, there is a common name, a name that we use to refer to this data that we use to encrypt uh, the encrypt, sorry, to decrypt the encrypted data. What is that name? That was the question. So you have given, most of you have given the right answer key. About VPN, that's a misleading answer. Uh, that is not what we are looking for. This algorithm, it is connected because we need an algorithm to decrypt. Yes, we need an algorithm to decrypt. But typically, this algorithm is public knowledge. Meaning everybody knows how AES works. Everybody knows how uh, DES works. So the encryption algorithms are public knowledge. The key is the secret. So if you have that key, then you can decipher the information. So just to add on what the key is, basically, nowadays we're seeing a trend of malware being even encrypted and being delivered. Because you know, like we have the firewalls at the perimeter, but we can't see what's being traversed in the firewalls when it's encrypted unless you have the key to decrypt. So key is one of the most important things. If you think cryptography is protecting your assets, no, it's being leveraged by the attackers as well. Same way you are doing all this, because the reason for that is the same mechanism we are using to protect ourselves can be used by the attackers to exploit our, our systems as well. So we are seeing that happening most of the time, because imagine you are sending the payloads broken into packets and encrypted. You will not identify any of that until it's at the endpoint and re-merge into together and decrypted. So these keys are important. And as we mentioned earlier, the botnets, uh, the uh, becoming the victims from the what we call uh, pirated software. That's the problem here because we don't know the keys can be delivered easily because you will understand because we will be generating keys in the latter stage of, of this course itself. The assignments are geared towards generating keys. So to give you the real idea of how these work. So then you will understand the keys are like KBs of in, uh, kilobits in size, sizes, and it might be a string of characters even. So that's the, the, the scary thing in this as well as the interesting thing as well. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, without a key, uh, whatever your encrypted data will be remains unreadable. Yes. So now, if Sarah or Jake wants to decipher or understand what the information is inside the USB stick, if the content is encrypted, they will need to get the key and decipher the information. So let's see whether that will be helpful in the future. Next question. So I, I don't read out the question because I assume that you need time to think. So if I'm speaking, then you will be like, oh, why this guy is speaking? Stop, right? So therefore, I'm not speaking. I hope you can see the, uh, the question on the screen.
it looks like we have a very good audience more many people are giving the right answer it is one um the reason why the mathematics behind it how that works we will look at throughout the course if you are talking about symmetric key encryption it is the same key it's like the two copies of the same key that the two parties are using so unless you have the same key at the two sides uh, when i say the two sides let's say i'm talking with randi for example i have a key randi has the same key and the information that i am encrypting if i am the sender randi will be able to decrypt using the same key at the receiver side that's how symmetric key encryption works so that's why the correct answer is one it's uh, basically like uh, having a one single key to lock and unlock your door so in a simple yes we'll start looking into the differences between symmetric and asymmetric throughout the course uh, we might even have an asymmetric key question i forgot whether we have it but even if you not you will see that in the course all right i think we have yes i assume that this is going to come up next we have uh, a question where you have to write some code but don't worry we don't expect you to write the code we will give you the written code right uh, randi if you have the code that we want to share i will quickly give some guidance to the people what about what they need to do in the meantime right so the code yeah. is ready we will add the code in the zoom chat randi whenever you are ready you can send it in the meantime let me explain what you need to do now the question is as jake reviews the usb's content he discovers that a piece of text appears to be a caesar cipher so don't worry if you don't know what a caesar cipher is you can simply understand that as a substitution cipher that means you have some text and you substitute the english letters or the english characters on that text with something else right it's a shift cipher let's go through the text below what jake does is jake jake shares a simple python script with you with you to decipher it the text that jake found is this and you can see this text doesn't make any sense right w k l v l v d no you can't make sense out of it so this is what the decrypted text looks like sorry the encrypted text looks like this is encrypted you now have to decrypt it and try to make sense out of it that is your task and in addition to this text there is a hint okay so what jake sees is this text and also the hint that's it nothing else what is the hint the hint is what is the number of wishes typically granted to someone who rubs a magic lamp with a genie inside i'm sure you have heard of like aladdin and this magic lamp so when aladdin rubs the lamp a genie comes out and in some cases a genie will have an evil laugh and will give aladdin some number of wishes the question is how many and that is your hint how many wishes were there keep that number in mind you will need to use that in the python script okay so the code is now here let me copy paste this so you can do the same with me All right so here is the the code you can simply google for online python interpreter or anything like that then you will get something this is where you can copy paste your code and you can get it to run all right so once you come to this point it asks you to enter the cipher text then what you need to do is you copy paste this content over here all right then it asks you for the shift value and for the shift value we have given you the hint 
the number of wishes that a genie will grant you. Okay. You enter the shift value, then you will get the decrypted text. Once you get the decrypted text, what you need to do is you need to add that as the answer. Okay. So you have five minutes to do this. Let's see what the question is. The question will be, can you help Jake find out what the original message is? So you have five minutes, take your time, find a Python on interpreter, copy paste the code and tell us what the message is after you decrypt it. you have two more minutes 14 people have given the answer let's hurry up a small a sp
we have 10 seconds now is the time to you know add some kana answers right let's see how many people got it right okay uh, this is a test was given by so one person missed the uh. Well, if it's a message, it has to be the complete message. So it should be, this is a test. Right? Let me show you again on Python. By the way, if you didn't figure out uh, how many wishes a genie will grant, then you can't do this. <laughs> right? So the hint is important. I'm sure you know that the genie grants you three wishes. Okay, so when you enter the ciphertext and it asks you to enter the shift value, then you put three you get the answer, this is a test. So how does it work? What happens is in the Caesar cipher, I need to open the English alphabet to explain that. In the Caesar cipher, it's not very complicated. It is nothing but a shift cipher, which shifts a given English character by a certain number of locations. So our original text is, this is a text, you take the letter T and in the alphabet, you can see the letter T is here. Our genie granted us three wishes. So you shift it by three locations, one, two, three, you get the letter W. And you repeat this for every character. Then uh, the character K becomes H, L becomes I, V becomes S and so on, right? So that's how the Caesar cipher works. This was the original message. This is a text test. Then the decryption, sorry, the encryption gave us this. And what you had to do is to reverse it. You had to decrypt it again and get the right answer. And the Python script was doing that. I hope that is clear. Right. I think that was fun. You have one more such question, by the way. You can, so please keep the Python interpreter open if you already opened one, because you have one more question where you have to copy paste a code and run something. Let's see what that is. But before that, we have a few other multiple choice questions to go. Who is leading now? Do we have the villain at the top? Yes, not. Ah, close competition. Probot and Vilan and Atula Loshanan. Right. Let's see who will remain at the top at the end of the quiz. Okay, I hope you're ready. That was a bit of a break for you as well. Maybe not everyone needed the five minutes. Let's see what the next question is. We are halfway through. The next questions will not take that long because we had to get you family with Mentimeter as well. We can finish this off within the next 15 to 20 minutes. Everyone has voted. Let's see the performance now. Ah. Many people have given the answer credential stuffing. Well, credential stuffing means that if an attacker finds your login details to one website, the attacker can simply try to use the same pair of username and password on other websites. We do that, right? I mean, you use the same password across multiple websites. 
So attackers can try to exploit that behavior. That is what we typically refer to as credential stuffing. So uh, the file, a list of names and passwords, right? We are asking what this list of names and passwords can be referred to as. We call it a password dump. You can use that or launch a dictionary attack on the password dump. That is possible. But the answer that we were looking for is a password dump. Just to add on that, like basically, uh, we all do that, right? So most of the time, most people maintain a one notepad file, especially engineers, which has all the usernames, passwords, IP address, or the URLs to the link. So this can be such a scenario because why? Uh, because the file was encrypted according to as per our story. So that that is how most of the, the engineers would keep their password, like some kind of a basic encryption with some uh, place to hide the password, but. Going forward, the smart way to do would be to use a password manager and use separate password everywhere because uh, that will help you, like just as uh, Dr. Subodha mentioned, to avoid a credential stuffing. Because imagine one password, one credential being compromised, and it can lead to the like at least 10, 15 other credentials being compromised because you might have reused the password everywhere. So, best strategy to avoid that is uh, stick with the password manager. And uh, rotate the password. Uh, don't like avoid reusing the passwords at all. That will be the best thing. Yeah. Yeah. Just to add on, uh, so the answers here: password dump is like a collection of usernames and passwords. And uh, like here, uh, dictionary attack. If we get, uh, it's like an attack we do to uh, get some password. So clearly, uh, we can see it's. Uh, uh, the attacks we are doing to get the password or the password dump is a collection of usernames and passwords. Yes. So password managers are definitely important. Um, there are several tools online, like different service providers available, like I myself use, if you can see my screen, uh, this is LastPass. That's uh, the password manager that I use. And it stored the password for Mentimeter, which is what you can see. But inside this one thing, all the website passwords are there and that master password is very strong. Uh, that's something that I even I have to very, it's very difficult to remember. So I had to practice uh, that one master password and it also has like multi-factor authentication, meaning that you put in the password and then you get a text message to your mobile phone or to your email and only then you can log into that password vault, right? So like that you can have multiple layers of security to ensure that you protect your information rather than having like a weak encryption scheme similar to what we saw, like Caesar cipher, it's very weak uh, to encrypt everything. But if you do that, then somebody can of course decrypt it and get the names and passwords. Okay, let's see what the next question is. This brings us to our second Python based question. So I told, asked you to uh, requested you to keep this open. We'll have to run a different code now. You will not get that much time. You will get three minutes now. Uh, so Randi, if you can add the code in the chat like you did last time. In the meantime, let me read this. Now the question is, here's the story. Even though these passwords are obscured in some way, Sarah believes that these passwords might belong to someone in the company. So now what happened? Initially, we told you about the Caesar cipher. You managed to decrypt. Then after decrypting, you got the password dump. You can see the, see the names, right? These, once you get this information, these passwords are also obscured in some way. There's another layer, for example. Then Sarah, who is our lead storyteller in this case, believes that these passwords might belong to someone in the company. And she suspects that one of these passwords is a combination of blue and a year from 1990s. Well, why blue? Maybe the favorite color. That's what we put in a password, right? And why 1990s? Maybe because that's when the, this person was born. Okay. So using a Python script, 
Sarah now wants to generate all possible combinations of passwords that combine the word blue and a year between 1990 and 1995. So this 1999 we have added here as a mistake because Mentimeter limits us the number of correct answers. So we have to limit. So please ignore this 1999. It should be 1995. Okay. So that's what you need to do. Let's see how this works. I'm going to copy this link and paste it here. This is our Python code. It's a very simple one, as you can see. So once you run it, what is the base word? You in input the base word. And after that, you input the year. Right? So then you will get the combination of all possible passwords that combine the words blue and a year between 1990 and 1995. You can pick one of them and submit that as the correct answer. That is the task that you have for this quiz. I'll tell you why that is important after you give the answer. Yes, we have four minutes. So when you get the answers, you can add any one of those combinations that you get. You can only input one, but any one of those combinations are correct. So we have less than a minute.
right well you have given the right answers uh, because of this automated nature of mentimeter that's why i was mentioning that you can only put one of those combinations as the right answer but everybody has gotten the idea okay so this shows the correct answer as only one but any one 19, 90, 90, 91, 90, 92, all those combinations are correct. So if I go here and then I add blue, mm -hmm. you will see the starting year, I added 1990, end year is 1995. All these answers are correct. So what we expected you to do is to copy one of these and put that in Ventimeter. All right. So here, uh... Sarah want to uh, generate a combination of passwords. So Sarah have uh, two keywords, 19, uh, 19th uh, years and the keyword blue. So what uh, Sarah done here is, uh, so there's a Python script. So she have the uh, keywords. So combining those keywords, she's uh, generating a, a list of uh, password combinations. So once anyone have a like a clear idea of uh, what combinations a password is using uh, they can uh, generate bunch of those passwords like example let's say in a company uh, uh, using a principle of uh, doing their passwords the first name and uh, their birth year so if someone get hang on uh, those a uh, combination they can easily uh, generate those uh, password combinations via uh, this uh, automated uh, work. So that's why you should not include commonly used names, numbers into your password, right? So the password dump that we found earlier had a list of passwords. And even if those passwords are obscured in some way, let's say using like a hash function, then people can generate these combinations and compare with the information that they found. So that's typically what we do in a dictionary attack. So if you're using your pet's name, your son, daughter, your parents' names, your significant other, well, that might not be a very good idea because you can automate these things really fast. And you saw how to do that by as a combination of a base word and a year. Of course, you can extend this. Sometimes what we do is when, when somebody asks, when, when a website asks us to put like a special character, what we do is we, let's say we do blue 1995 and then we put like an exclamation mark at the end or we put a hash. So these are very predictable, right? So these things can be broken uh, very easily through simple scripts. That's something that you should not do. Okay. Let's move on to the next question. I believe that is clear. Let's see what the last three to four questions are. Okay. Everyone has voted. The question was, which term describes harmful software designed to damage, exploit, or disable computers and computer systems? The correct answer is malware. So you know this already. Uh, let's see what the next question is without taking any more time. Okay, so we have... Right, so we have a very tight competition at the top. Still, things can change. You only have three more questions to go. We should be able to wrap it up within the next few minutes. All right. Let's see the next question.
Okay. The correct answer we actually gave earlier during the same session, we used the word social engineering. I think it was when we were talking about the Trojan horse, but anyway, yeah. Social engineering is the word that we use when somebody tricks um, another person into revealing sensitive information. So it's not a fault of the system, but rather a weakness of the human, of the individual. That's uh, what we refer to as social engineering. Just to uh, give a, like some common example, let's say uh, you are getting an email from Amazon saying, okay, there's a 75% discount. You have to get this in within a one hour. So not all might go and check whether this is clearly from Amazon and not. Uh, so people click the link in order to get the discount within an hour. Uh, so the, then they uh, ask for the Amazon username and password. So with that, you won't get any discount, but attacker gets succeeded. So those are the kind of uh, social engineering attacks. Yes. And they look very legitimate. Even the if you look at the URL, that can be coming from not Amazon.com, of course. You can't do that. It might be coming from AmazonOnline.com. And looking at it, you kind of get the feeling that this is actually legitimate. So. Yeah, just read on what uh, Dr. Shah. So both said, so if you look at the uh, the latest cost of data breach report from the IBA, you will see that one of the major vectors is the social engineering attack because why you don't have to like uh, crack through all these sophisticated security mechanisms. A mere credential compromise through social engineering from a low-level person, like um, what I mean is a, a, a unprivileged person in the your corporate organization, session can basically cripple the entire operation so why waste uh, time and money on the attacking the sophisticated security when you can breach the easiest part so social engineering is one of the most easiest to implement and one of the easiest ways to exploit uh, the weakness in the organization well, they say that an organization is as strong as its weakest link so why not exactly okay Last two questions, 11 and 12. Let's see what they are. Right. This answer also we gave earlier, uh, mainly uh, Dr. Shamita, when he was speaking, he talked about the CIA triad, right? So that's the question. Um, integrity, availability, and confidentiality. These are main pillars. When we look at security solutions and also things that can go wrong, we kind of structure our defenses around these concepts. Versatility is not one of them. Right, let's go to the final question. I hope you are ready. Okay. So we expected you to answer this based on your WhatsApp knowledge. I'm assuming everyone here is uh, using WhatsApp. When data is encrypted in a way that even the entity responsible for the encryption can't access the original data without the user's permission, uh, we call it to be encrypted in an end-to-end -end, end -end encryption. Right?
Yes. So every other word uh, that you see as answers, it has its own meaning. Like we can talk about like multi-layer encryption, one way, uh, one wayness of things, and yeah. So end-to-end -end encryption is what we refer to as based on the uh, the question that was given here. Okay, so I think we are ready to look at the final leaderboard and I would kindly like to request uh, the person at the top to drop a message on Zoom with your email. So if you get multiple messages, then we know that you're live. Because only one winner is there, right? Okay, so we have Probod, Probod, it's really hard to pronounce this, but Congratulations to the winners and everybody who's at the top. Uh, it was for fun. But as I said, there will be a small surprise. Uh, send your email, then we'll get in touch with you. Okay. Prabodh, am I pronouncing your name? By the way, you can unmute and speak. Uh, yes, it's uh, Prabodh. Prabodh, okay. Yes. I wasn't sure which. Yes, thank you. Uh, <laughs> congratulations, uh, Prabodh. And thank you for thank taking you. actively and giving the right answers. Sure. Right, and congratulations to Vilan and Gayanath, Atula, Shane, and everybody uh, who took part. Okay, so I think we took a quite a bit of time to go through that. Mm -hmm. Let's. I wanted to highlight on a few other things before we wrap up the session for today. Let's go back to the slides for that. Mm -hmm. Prabodh, uh, please send us your okay we have it please yes i was going to say send your email we have it we'll reach out to you with the surprise okay so to wrap things up we'll take about uh, I believe about 15 to 20 minutes. So we are taking a bit more time than we initially promised. So if anybody has any other commitments, uh, we will be uploading the recording. So you're not missing anything, but we wanted to take the remaining 15 to 20 minutes to tell you a few things about the course, what you can expect from day two onwards. So let's quickly go through that. Uh, the course outline. So you might have guessed this, but this is the outline or the content that we are going to cover. This is on the webpage as well. So you know. Uh, we'll start with the introduction. We look at symmetric, asymmetric, key exchange, hashing, and authentication. So all this content will be delivered to you the way that we demonstrated to you right now. Through questions, through interactive sessions, we'll provide you the resources. Right? We'll also have some recorded content, some recorded lectures for you to get the theoretical understanding that you can watch anytime throughout the week, whenever you are free. And when you come to the live session, then you can ask questions, you can interact, we can work on the code uh, together, we can ask you the questions through Mentimeter. So that is the structure that we are going to use. So this is not going to be the traditional classroom where you sit and listen to a lecture. It will be a very hands-on session. We will be working together with you. That is the whole idea, right? We will also have some assignments to evaluate your knowledge. And even for the assignments, we will work with you. I'll, I'll tell you about that when we come to that. So to give you some more information about the content, so on the symmetric key, these are some of the subtopics that we'll be covering. Starting with the overview, let me, my video is getting on the way. Okay, better. Otherwise, I, I wasn't sure whether my video window is blocking the slide, right? So about the symmetric key cryptography part, uh, this is the rough outline. We look at the basics. We look at modern block cipher design, uh, different modes of, there's a typo here. It should be operation, not PP ration. Operation, modes of operation and different attack scenarios. And we'll also look at asymmetric key encryption, uh, RSA, and the security of it, how digital signatures work, how the public key infrastructure works, we'll talk about. Then to enable symmetric key Encryption, a critical component is the key. So how can two people get a key? We'll answer that question. I asked, we had this question in the in the quiz as well. 
how can two people get the same key i gave the example where i was communicating with randi and the two of us had the same key but how did they get the key can't you use the same method to exchange messages as well so we'll talk about that what are the things that people used in the past and right now uh, the state of the art uh, techniques that people use we will talk about then uh, about hash functions this is another vital component in the cryptography discussion a vital ingredient in cryptography we will talk about uh, the difference between hashing and encryption the one way nature of hash functions and some examples and some use cases as well we'll talk about and then to once you have those things we will apply them in applications and one of our main applications will be an authentication system where you have to log into your system using usernames and passwords so we'll talk about the the broader topic of credentials what passwords are cracking passwords some mitigation techniques and some best practices so these are the basic concepts that we want to deliver this will be your fundamentals without these it's very hard to properly understand any other security mechanism so it's like your salt and pepper right you cannot cook any meal without any of those similarly without having that fundamental understanding of these key concepts it's very hard to understand and become a competitive competitive engineer so that's why we say this is a beginners level course we'll start from the very basics and all these basics will be delivered to you in the structure that i told you earlier recorded content interactive questions codes of course we'll be using python if you forgot uh, how to use python we'll also give you some study materials as well if anybody is not familiar so we'll guide you it's not like if, let's assume that there is someone here who has no idea about python well that's fine we'll give you the study materials and whenever we give you a piece of code we will explain that we will work with you okay but of course you the effort from your side will have to be there otherwise it's very difficult to make a successful course okay so we'll put our own effort of course uh, to the best of our abilities and we expect you to put your effort as well and at the end of the course you will definitely get something very useful and we plan to have intermediate and more advanced level courses after this as well but none of those things can happen unless you have the fundamental knowledge so this topics that i showed you and the content that i showed you in the subsequent slides these things will be centered around a main course project right and the course project will also be your assignment so there was something that we talked about uh, me as a lecturer in the university typically what we do is we teach the content to the students and then we give an assignment the student will submit the assignment then the student will get a grade when you compare that approach with what actually happens in the industry you will see a disjoint what what i mean by that is in the industry it is never the case of you submitting something and you getting a grade that is not what happens what happens is you submit something your supervisor will give you some feedback then you modify it your work based on that you work iteratively until you get it right that's what typically happens in the industry so in this course you will get that experience what i mean by that is once you start with the assignments you will do some initial submission we will give you some feedback and then you will refine your content based on that that is the idea right so let me share some more information with you about the projects and i will ask yashen uh, to talk about the projects in a little bit more detail what we expect uh, from you when you go through the four components of the of the course project yashin yeah so uh, as dr subodh mentioned our one of the key objective was to basically just not act as assessment where you will be evaluated but to just give you the uh, what you will experience in the real world once you are in the industry so you have to make it work somehow at the same time you will have to adhere to the guidelines so 
these cause the, the the assessments will be designed in a way that it has some kind of a lab activity so you are supposed to do some kind of activity may it be let's say for example certificates you might you will be asked to generate a a, a, a key certificate a key pair basically a private and a public key so using those keys how we gonna secure a communication what are the parameters inside of a key itself then you will be asked okay let's go and generate a, a, what we call the ssl certificate itself so because ssl certificates are the underlying underneath under, like basically underlying security mechanism the whole internet the what we call the https community Communication is built upon. So we will be basically generating these files with you. These certificates, encryption algorithms will be encrypting text with you to the point where like you will be asked to perform these tasks in a lab environment. So these don't require much comprehensive, uh, sophisticated, uh, I would say compute requirements because we are running on the basic, basic level. It is as uh, Dr. Subodha mentioned. So if you will basically need is your machine with running uh, Python install on top of that. If you're in a Linux environment, you can, we can use the bash terminal. If you're using a Windows environment, again, we can use the PowerShell. If you're using Mac, again, we can back to the uh, bash terminal itself. We can use this equipment. So we are running these things in the basic level that we require. And then uh, these assignments will be basically guided. Like one thing being connected to the other thing, which will be uh, mapped against what we study. So will be encryption, we'll be studying about the AES, how to use AES using Python scripting. At the same time, we will give you a guided guide to itself because sometimes we'll, we'll go and say, okay, there are some certain packages in Python, in PyCrypto functions where we are, we, where you can just import the function and get it done. But what we want you to do is to get the fundamentals, basics, understanding of how to implement that. For that reason, we will be say, okay, you cannot use these functions, but you have to implement the uh, AES itself there. So we will guide you because once you start doing that, you will be coming across a plethora of problems because why there are so many things. Uh, Python has been evolving. Now we are using Python version three. Some packages are like a bit old and some packages are new. So interoperability issues might be there. So because of that, we will guide you through. So as uh, Dr. Subodha mentioned, we'll ask you to like, we'll have interactive sessions in the middle just before uh, the submission of the assignment so that we will give you feedback and we will guide you saying, okay, we know once you start doing this, these are the challenges that you will come across because we have done already, we have done this and we have come across the challenges as well. So what we will do is we will guide you through that saying, okay, you are going in a wrong path or you are just uh, not using the proper parameters, proper inputs, do like this, you will be, get, uh, you will be able to sort those issues. So we will guide you through. So. What our encouragement, as Dr. Subodha mentioned, is uh, whenever you have a problem, come to us because in the industry, like once you go to the industry, you are not like the only guy there. You are you have one 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 member of a team where there will be superiors or there will be peers. So you can get the advice and all that. So we want to create that kind of a a coexistive co environment where we all learn by each other. So because of that reason, uh, we thought of like going forward and just creating some interactive sessions on these assignments to evaluate the progress, to answer the challenges, problems that you have come across. So that is how it is being done. And these are all geared towards the industry, what is happening in the industry. So you might think, okay, uh, generating a certificate, it's nothing serious, right? So you just uh, get the CSR value, upload it to the uh, one of the CAs and you can get it done. But that's that's one way of doing it. There are so many other ways. The whole industry, whole world works on the on that. So we will be showing you what's really happening to the point that okay, uh, you don't have to rely upon any of the CS to get a certificate. You can generate your own CS certificate, like basically generate your own certificate using open source CS like OpenSSL and all that. So that is where we want to push you towards. So that is how uh, we have structured these assessments, and at the same time, these assessments will talk about the fundamentals, application of fundamentals to basic use cases so that you will have a better understanding once you go into the uh, work in the industry. Okay, this is what we have done there. And this is exactly the same concept I'm applying to a different use case, that's it. So that is how we have decided these uh, assessments, assignments, I would say, uh, to evaluate, basically emulate the basic level of understanding you, a person should have with the sound knowledge on cryptograph uh, cryptography fundamentals. So that is uh, what we have done here so far. Yeah. Thank you, Ashin. Okay, so I hope you are clear about the course project. 
it will be delivered through several assessments and just like our usb stick story they will be this will be stitched in a coherent manner so that you can understand where things are headed in addition so you can see there are four assignments throughout the course and we expect you to complete them and then you will be eligible for the completion certificate in addition to these four assignments we will have weekly lectures live sessions so in those live sessions we will again have the interactive sessions that we talked about right some of those live sessions will be used to work with you on the course project and some of them will be used to teach you the theory some of the theory as i mentioned earlier will be delivered to you through recorded content and once you watch the content we will work with you ask you questions to un to make sure that you understood it give you some alternative explanations we will pretty much have a very interactive discussion right now it brings me to some of the interactive content that we will be covering throughout the session here is another story that we will be using to deliver the content or the concepts to you introducing Let's alex the city's cybersecurity expert hello how are you i'm alex from now on you will work with alex and help to keep the city's digital infrastructure safe just then, in the bustling metropolis of Cyber City, a shadowy incident was brewing that would put the city's digital infrastructure to the test. Well, that's a very short clip, but this is another story that we'll be structuring our interactive content around. You will be working with an engineer Alex and Alex will need some help from you. Alex will ask for help and you should have the knowledge to provide that expertise to Alex. Prandi, uh, would you like to add anything to this? Yes. So as uh, Dr. Subodhi mentioned, you will uh, dig deeper into this incident and uh, following these uh, concepts that Arias mentioned uh, regarding the cryptographic fundamental, you will find how the attacker got into the system. What are the loopholes in uh, authentication or systems? So how to fix those? What are the best practices you can follow along going forward? So likewise, you will dig deeper into those concepts uh, in this incident. So yeah, let's see uh, how you can uh, outplay the attack in coming weeks. Yes. So we'll give you a hypothetical scenario. And based on that, we'll you can work with us, with Alex, uh, to help Alex to get through and to make sure the cyber city's digital infrastructure is secure. All right. So folks, uh, that's what's going to happen uh, throughout the course. And this content will be delivered by this panel. Uh, myself, Yashen, Randi, Sandushan, Kitmin, Chamita, and uh, Ranga. So this will be our panel of lecturers. Uh, some of them will, of course, be supervisors. This will mainly be delivered by the four of us, myself, Yashen, Randi, and Sandushan. Right. And we cannot emphasize this enough. We spent about three months before this day planning for this course, structuring the content. So it is developed such that it is outcome oriented. We want to make sure that we give you the fundamentals with real world applications and everything was custom made. Uh, we of course have had references from other sources, but the structure and the story and the nature of it is delivered as a, as a brand new uh, course. Few other remarks. This will be conducted in English, as you can imagine. If you have any trouble understanding, you don't understand what a certain word means, you can, of course, ask us. Then if, if and when required, we'll be providing you with the singular and Tamil explanations. Every day, we will allocate time for Q&A. Uh, we will hold what we call office hours, where we can have a conversation if some student is struggling uh, to understand we will of course be more than happy to get on an extra session with that person and to figure things out well once you learn these things there are a lot of things that you can potentially do it's a booming industry this can be your gateway you will get the hands-on experience and the industry ready exposure and i showed you earlier several players in the cyber security domain and these people they of course pay very high salaries and if you get the chance to work for them then Eventually, that is what we that we want all of you to achieve with the knowledge that you have. 
that is given that that's your expectation for your career path to the future and eventually we hope you will be able to contribute to the development of new technologies and capabilities that will drive the future of cybersecurity and computing in general so the second day of the class that will be next weekend uh, we'll send all the information about the schedule uh, to people who will enroll in this course after making the payment so that will be the deadline will be next wednesday 27th september if you go to this website you will see all the information that you need so let me go to the website and show you then things will be clear to you this is the email that we sent to all the registered participants the payment options are here uh, so you can choose whatever is convenient for you earlier we had some people joining from outside of sri lanka as well so under payment options you will see options like paypal for example uh, but i believe most of you are joining they you are from sri lanka so you can uh, make the payment directly to a bank account information is given so what you need to do is if you decide to continue in the course from day to onwards you please make the payment according to these instructions given here there are uh, discounts available for students and to some other professional members as well like ieee and also the trace community members once you do that make sure you fill the google form right so the form you can use to add your information name and other personal details and also you can upload your payment slip through this right so please make sure you do this by the deadline and make sure you follow the instructions for example uh, there was one incident that we had in the past where people use like an atm fund transfer machine then it becomes very difficult for us to identify who made the payment but if you use like a remark using your national id number then we can identify who that is okay so please follow the instructions it's not very complicated it will only take you a minute or two to read everything and uh, act according to those instructions i hope that is clear let me go back to the slides so that's what you need to do uh, before day 2 and uh, to the people who enroll through the enrollment form this one the, the one that i just showed you we will email you with all the information we'll have a whatsapp group so that we can stay in touch there'll be a learning management system that we use to to store the recorded videos we will send you credentials for that so please make sure uh, you if you are continuing to fill the google form by the deadline and the course completion requirement to obtain the certificate we told you earlier we will not be taking attendance all the sessions will be recorded and will be uploaded to the learning management system but we highly encourage you to take part because that is how we can interactively discuss things uh, that will be very helpful for you but that's not mandatory we understand that you can be from the industry you might have any other commitments during the weekends so if you miss one or two don't worry the recorded content will be added and the evaluation criteria for course completion is the completion of the assignments or the projects these four that we talked about i hope that's clear and to wrap up i wanted to mention a few things now these courses we have been conducting for about 2 years now so if you go to our website you will see that uh, we conducted courses in several domains this is the first time we are doing a course in cyber security which is why we had to spend quite a bit of time about 3 months to develop all the content from scratch Uh, the previous courses that we did they were mainly in the area of electronic in general we had courses on microcontroller programming we had courses on uh, system verilog that's mainly processor design so if i go to the website i can show you some of those courses so about that here are some of the courses that we have conducted in the past some of you might have taken those courses this was the most recently completed one embedded product design for iot we did system verilog this is processor design and we did a course on embedded machine learning edge computing and this is a beginners level course so we have mainly three main thematic areas that we work with that is internet of things computer architecture and cyber security under internet of things we looked at microcontrollers edge computing all these things 
under computer architecture we looked at processor design and under cyber security this is our first course so down the line we also plan on developing a course on iot security but to do those advanced courses we need to have the foundation so that is why we are getting started with the cryptography fundamentals course and when we were doing these courses we throughout the two years we learned our lessons as well as lecturers because we believe in improving as content providers or as lecturers creators of courses uh, here are some lessons learned and steps taken one lesson is that students need extra help i touched upon this so we had office hours and special attention uh, given to these students to make sure they can understand and sometimes the certificates got delayed to be sent out at the end of the course this was again due to several reasons sometimes the students ask for extensions of assignments that delayed things and we have some approvals that need to be taken now with the experience of the past two years we have taken steps to streamline all the processes and to make sure that those delays do not happen we've also in some of our early courses we have tried to cover a lot of topics in a short period and we got the feedback from the students saying that it sometimes is too much to understand so therefore we have limited like the content but we have gone more into in in depth explanations into these topics so that's one thing that we have understood especially the beginners of course you need time to understand and to add on top of that we've also given you like study materials that you can refer to later so all these things came as a part of our learning curve uh, in our previous courses so in the website you can also see um also see some of uh, the the feedback that we received uh, for our courses so far let me see if i can find one yeah so like 50 reviews you can read them the reviews are at the bottom that we received for our uh, previous courses so you can refer to them then maybe you wrote the reviews yourself if you took these courses uh, previous courses with us and we've also understood that students rarely ask questions we don't know why but well we have a fairly okay guess of why that is but to prevent that from happening we 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 started using interactive questions through tools like mentimeter so we did not have these mentimeter interactions in the first few courses but we learned our lesson so therefore if you don't ask us any questions then we will ask questions we'll have a conversation because that is the way to learn right you because you might have heard if you listen to something versus you you like say something out loud versus you engage in something so these are different levels of acquiring knowledge and as you can guess just listening is the is like the lowest level of acquiring knowledge the more you get engaged the more things will get registered in your brain that is what we we want to happen so thank you very much for everyone we are at the 330 mark so we took two and a half hours um with slide breaks in the middle as well so it's very grateful for all of you joining uh, on a on a weekend on a saturday afternoon and we look forward to having all of you uh, from day 2 onwards and my special thank to our keynote speaker dr shamita dialvis uh, the head of the department at entc dr anga rodrigo um, and for all the the entire team uh, backing uh, this this particular course so we hope you got something out of it and we expect to see most of you from day 2 onwards being continuously engaged with the course thank you very much again have a pleasant evening and a good weekend you too thank you very much